This video is sponsored by Raycon. Hello, my beautiful watchers, and welcome to the start of my Twilight Saga Book Review Marathon. I don't have a catchy name for it yet, because every time I've thought I've come up with a funny playlist title in the past, someone in the comments has inevitably thought of something much better, so I'm just accepting it this time, leave your suggestions below. This review is going to be compartmentalized into numbered parts, which is not my standard modus operandi, but in this case I was finding it impossible to stay focused on reviewing the book without a hard structure to follow. Surprisingly, this wasn't due to the book being exceptionally bad, but because I just couldn't stop thinking about all the drama that famously surrounds this series. It was really hard to resist slipping into writing a deep dive post-mortem into Twilight's runaway popularity and the subsequent backlash, and or write a video essay on the philosophical implications of it all. I might have been several pages into writing this before I remembered that that's not what I said I was going to do here just a few days ago. I need to review these books, not try to explain their place in the universe. Though, if that is something you would be genuinely interested in hearing my thoughts on, let me know. For now, in order to stay on target, I gave myself five rather simple questions about this book to answer. Part 1. What is Twilight? Twilight is a young adult romance novel published in 2005 and written by American author Stephanie Meyer. It is the first of four books in the Twilight Saga, which have collectively sold over 100 million copies worldwide in 37 languages. I'm not going to waste too much time on this particular section. You guys know what Twilight is. Loved, hated, parodied, attacked, defended, plagiarized. I talked a bit about my 15-year personal journey with these books in my introductory video, but the too long didn't read is this is my first time actually reading them for myself, and I really, really, really tried to go into this with an open mind. That uh, probably sounded quite ominous. Part 2. What happens in Twilight? You almost certainly know this too, but let's synopsisize this mother lover anyway, just as a refresher. This is the short version. Hello, I'm new in town. Stay away from me, I'm dangerous. Hey, let's hang out, I love you. You act like a vampire. I am a vampire. I am so in love with you, I will literally die without you. <laughs> I'm going to drink your blood. Sexy brood boy, punch! Hooray, you should make me into a vampire too. No. However, just in case that wasn't sufficient, here is the longer version. 17-year-old Bella Swan comes to live in a small town in Washington to stay with her police chief father when her mother remarries and has to start moving around a lot for her husband's sports career. To her surprise, as this isn't usually the case, she's instantly popular in her new school and the object of attention for every horny lad her age. The one exception to this being Edward Cullen, a freakishly pale but beautiful boy who's seated next to her in class and who seems agitated and enraged by her very existence one day, then attempts to be friendly the next before returning to open hostility again. Bella begins to suspect something is a tad dodgy about him when he appears to display superhuman speed and strength to save her from a potentially fatal automobile accident. She then crosses paths with a nice young lad called Jacob who lives on a nearby reservation, who tells her that there's a ridiculous myth amongst his people about a group of immortal vampires that live in the area and were at odds with his shape-shifting ancestors. With this in mind, she researches vampire lore and notices some similarities between it and the behavior of her sexy savior. Shortly Later, Edward saves her again, this time from being sexually assaulted on the street, and they hash out the whole being a vampire thing. It turns out his entire family are creatures of darkness, but they mostly confine themselves to eating animals for ethical reasons. Also, he can telepathically read minds. He explains that he's been behaving the way he has and has become obsessed with her because the smell of her blood is ridiculously appealing to him, comparing it to the pull a recovering addict feels towards heroin. He admits he came within inches of feeding on her the day they met, and he's worried he might snap and kill her at any moment, so she would be significantly safer if they stayed away from each other. However, he no longer has the willpower to do that and agrees to date her if she's willing to accept the ever-present danger of being horribly murdered and fed on if his self-control falters for even a second. Bella immediately agrees because she's already so in love with him the possibility of a grisly end doesn't face her one bit. Things seem to be going quite well for a little while, despite being nervous about showing her what he looks like in direct sunlight, Bella is quite into the skin made of crushed diamonds effect it has on him, and she's also flattered to discover that Edward has been following her everywhere without her knowing and listening in on all her conversations using his vampire super hearing. She's a little upset that he's been breaking into her house every night to watch her sleep, but only because she's apparently a sleep talker and was worried that she'd said something embarrassing. 
During a super-powered game of baseball, the Cullens attract the attention of three vampires who just happen to be passing through the area, and one of them apparently gets his jollies from hunting very difficult prey. Edward's super obvious protectiveness over Bella makes her his new target. In an attempt to keep her safe, the family takes her far away, but the evil vampire tricks her into coming to him by pretending to have her mother hostage. He tries to torture her to death and bites her on the hand, infecting her with vampirism, but Edward and his family turn up just in the nick of time and kill the bad guy, and he uses colossal self-control to drink just enough of her blood to suck out the vampire juice, but not enough to kill her. As she's recovering, it becomes a point of contention that he didn't just let her become a vampire because she wants to live forever with him at the same age, but he doesn't want to inflict the unlife of a vampire on her. For his part, he feels pretty bad about being the reason that she was in danger, but she points out that two of the four times she nearly died in the book were nothing to do with him, so she's probably still safer with him than without him. Then they go to prom, the end. Part 3. So, how was Twilight, really? To say that Stephanie Meyer is a terrible writer would definitely be unfair as far as I'm concerned. As I mentioned in the introductory video, E.L. James taught me what true talent deficit reads like, and Meyer is leagues better than that. That said, I probably wouldn't put her any higher than the upper end of bad. Her overuse of hyperbole is to the point of being distressing to read, especially in the invariably worshipful way that Bella describes Edward's good looks. Her issue with redundant adjectives isn't the worst I've ever read, but I have to confess, traitor her tears betraying me had me laughing for an ungodly amount of time. CURSE YOU TEARS OF TREACHEROUS BETRAYAL, YOU BETRAYING TRAITORS OF TREASON! The story structure of this book is a catastrophe. The first 80% seems to be building towards a big will they be able to make it work despite the danger he represents question, then suddenly with no warning the bad guy shows up and the climax hard right turns into a life or death situation that barely ties into anything else that's happened so far. The only tenuous connection to the rest of the book is the situation forces Edward to discover that he can control himself and avoid killing her, because if he can do it while literally drinking her blood, he can do it any time. Though, from what I can see, it also confirmed his fear that being around him in general puts Bella in a lot of unnecessary danger, so the end of the book mostly cancelled itself out regarding overarching plot progression. Two preconceptions about Bella that I'm ashamed to say I stated as fact in videos past without having confirmed for myself was that she is, as a protagonist, mostly a blank slate for the audience to project themselves onto, and what little personality she does have is not very nice. I guess that I believe that both of these things turned out to be true, though believe it or not, my first impression of her was actually pretty good. In the introductory chapter, we find out that she's made the pretty selfless decision to come live somewhere she doesn't particularly like because she feels her mother needs the space and time to make her new marriage work. She's then less than enthusiastic about her father's idea of her driving around a 20-year-old truck, but she immediately recognizes the gesture he's trying to make by buying it for her and accepts it with genuine humility and gratitude. However, it wasn't long before my opinion soured. Her thoughts are just so casually judgmental and cruel. She mentally dubs one of her new friends a Labrador for being too excited to talk to her, she apparently doesn't check in with her mother for days after arriving, even to tell her that she made it safe, and then tries to gaslight the poor woman into thinking she's overreacting for being concerned about that. Girl, that's your mother! Give her a damn update! And she's so instinctively critical of other people's appearances. If she doesn't know someone's name, she'll call them the girl with the braces and the bad perm. It's just kind of unpleasant being in the head of someone like that. Now, you might have noticed that I'm reviewing her character based almost exclusively on the opening chapters, and that is because I don't really have a choice. Once the romance plot gets going, the character development effectively stops because her every waking thought and action revolves around Edward from then on. Those opening chapters are the only times we see her defined by anything other than her love for him, hence why she has a reputation for being a blank slate. This might be doing Maya a disservice, but judging from this, it seems almost like the audience avatar appeal of Bella might have been an accidental bonus of poor character writing as opposed to an intentional feature. So, Edward Cullen, the personal space violating, privacy denying stalker with the face of an angel. If you can somehow put aside the implications of someone his age romantically pursuing a minor, you're still left with one creepy ass dude. I think what bothered me the most about that whole thing is how easily it could have been a logical character flaw for Edward to have at first, and what good character growth it would have been for him to learn to overcome it for Belle's sake, if 
only Maya had written it as a flaw and not a romantic act of devotion. Hear me out. Yes, Edward has no human decency when it comes to boundaries, but he's not human. He can pass for human enough to blend in fine at school, but he still spends a long time, like almost a century or so, doing whatever the hell he wants when it comes to mind reading and trespassing, simply because he can, and because he's never met anyone besides his family that he's cared about enough to feel the need to reevaluate his behavior. Combine that with the fact that he's always kept himself slightly detached from humanity in general, and it's not hard to see how he might have lost his moral compass and even his basic awareness that he might need to accommodate someone besides himself at some point. It would be genuinely possible that it might not have occurred to him that what he was doing was wrong unless he suddenly started giving a rat's ass about the happiness of a particular human and then sees how unhappy it makes her. So because he wants to show her some basic respect and dignity, he starts working really hard on resisting the urge to spy on her or anyone else. In my opinion, flaws can make a good character amazing, but the author has to be aware that they are flaws. But but no. Just how unacceptable his behaviour is, is never truly acknowledged in any way beyond extremely minor comments in this or any later book. It seems to have been written to either be regarded as genuinely romantic, or a character flaw so insignificant it's more than worth putting up with to get the benefits that come with him. Which makes the next logical question to bring up, what are those benefits? We know that Edward is powerless to resist Bella because she's so enticing to his vampire senses, but why is Bella so into the shiny wanker in return? The book is filled to the brim with declarations of undying love, both Eddie and Belle express deep feelings, and young Miss Swan never ceases to think about how much she loves her pale boy toy, but they never express why, and the book doesn't provide any indicator as to why they might be into each other. For the sake of fairness, let's list the ones that Belle does express, at least internally. The most often brought up in the book, and remembered by readers, is his almost ethereal good looks. The dude is pretty as heck, and I don't think anyone would claim that's not a valid thing to be into in of itself, it just looks a tad shallow when it's almost exclusively the only thing someone thinks about when they decide they love someone. The only other positive thing about him that she seems to be consciously aware of is that he makes her feel safe in his presence, and yeah, I'd say that's legit. A feeling of safety is a deeply desirable thing in a significant other. Whether it's a logical feeling for her to get from Sparkles is more open to debate. I mean, it's true the dude can run interference between her and an out-of-control vehicle, but he also makes it explicitly clear that he is consistently one long sniff away from drinking her like a Dr. Pepper. There are some additional reasons why I think that Bella and, more importantly, the reader might be into Edward, but we'll come back to those because they're never explicitly in the text. What is in the text is, when he's not spying on Bella, Edward is constantly condescending to her, he teases her even when she makes it clear to him that it's upsetting and frustrating her, and the closest he gets to complimenting her is when he expresses surprise that she is unaware that she is good-looking. He's also completely dismissive of her feelings, in particular the feeling of terror about him driving them at over 100 miles per hour as standard. The inconsiderate jerk tries to make her feel like she's overreacting to Helen back for begging him to slow down even a little bit. Despite only having, like, two conversations with Jacob in the entire book, Bella still has significantly better chemistry with him than the guy she's determined to be with. Wait, am I... Does does that make me Team Jacob? Is that something that I have to go through life being now? Anyway, despite this... Ugh, my beautiful watchers, the level of extreme codependency in this human-vampire relationship is terrifying. Within days of meeting her, Edward doesn't feel he can be away from her for any period of time, hence the continuous stalking, and Bella joins the club pretty fast too. By the end of the book, she has a literal panic attack at the idea of moving away from him. It's so blatantly unhealthy. Another thing that I regretfully proclaimed as fact for years sans first-hand evidence was Belle was only in love with Edward because he's drop-dead gorgeous and utterly obsessed with her, because that's all Stephanie Meyer and her shallow, narcissistic audience of teen girls believe is needed for love to flourish. And while the subconscious misogyny that the ipso facto conclusion about the author and fanbase was founded on was unceremoniously revealed to me by an unseasoned serving of harsh browns from a video essayist, now that I have read the book I can at least say that I wasn't wrong about Bella. Or was I? You see, my beautiful watchers, I believe I observed a pretty explicit explanation for Bella's overwhelming adoration for Edward worked into the book in several places. I'm the world's best predator, aren't I? Everything about me invites you in. My voice, my face, even my smell. I had to run out, to get away before I could speak the words that would make you follow. He looked up then at my staggered expression as I tried to absorb his bitter memories. His golden eyes scorched from under his lashes, hypnotic and deadly. You would have come, he promised. I tried to speak calmly, without a doubt. As predators, we have a glut of weapons in our physical arsenal. Much, much more than really necessary. 
the strength, the speed, the acute senses, and then, like a carnivorous flower, we are physically attractive to our prey. It seems pretty clear to me that Edward and the others straight up acknowledge the fact that in the Twilight verse, vampires have evolved to be like a flytrap or an anglerfish. They inescapably draw their prey to them before devouring them. There's an irresistible allure to them that no one can resist, not even necessarily magical, but physical, olfactory, chemical, that overrides the survival instincts of humans and drives them into such maddening depths of love for their predator, they go willingly to their doom. This perfectly explains why every adult woman in this book turns into a teen hungry pedophile when Edwin enters the room, though that's still a pretty feckin' creepy thing to include regardless. It explains Bella's instant obsession despite having no deep reason to love an arse like Edward, and why the idea of dying horribly at his hands doesn't faze her. It's his evolutionary abilities working as intended. She's being constantly drawn into a trap that isn't springing closed on her, a moth to a flame that resists burning her, alive but still drawn harder and harder with every passing moment. There can be no Team Jacob. Bella doesn't have a choice in this. She's being forced to love Edward in a way that even Edward has no control over. Edward is irresistible to Bella because of vampire lore, Bella is irresistible to Edward because she happens to be his heroine, mutual brainwashing at the hands of an evolutionary quirk of an apex predator. So easy explanation, though I think this actually makes Maya's understanding of love look much, much worse because the book still treats what they have as true and genuine despite being something that neither of them has any control over or would necessarily want. Though is love something you ever have control over? I mean, people fall in love with bad people, or people who are bad for them, or that they simply can't be with all the time. You know, as tempting as it is to dismiss this out of hand, I think we first have to ask, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, don't hurt me no more. This, why we fall in and with who, are subjects that will be debated until the end of time, but if you want to be completely scientific about it, love is nothing more than a change in the biochemistry of our brains. Adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, oxycontin, vasopressin. And you might say, don't be so literal. When we talk about love, we mean all the things that cause those chemicals and the resulting feelings to occur within you. It's the great union of your attraction to someone, the kindness they've shown you, the romantic memories you've created in your time together, the future you hope to have with them, and a thousand other things. The problem is that doesn't necessarily make it some transcendent, inexplicable thing. It's still the sum of our perceptions and experiences with someone else. We are being affected by another person to feel strongly for them. I don't think that I can in good faith say that the love between Bella and Edward is lesser just because there's less steps involved. This story about Two people who don't make each other very happy, or don't even seem to like each other very much, but are drawn together by an involuntary mutual magnetism, is a love story. There's nothing special about love. There never was. Love is just a non-consensual result of things. All this time we've been telling ourselves that we hated Stephanie Meyer for making vampires shiny, to desperately try to avoid having to acknowledge that we actually hated her for pulling back the curtain on the very existence of love, and reminding us all that the beauty we've assigned to it since the dawn of time is just garish decoration, another in a long line of kind lies that we've told ourselves to distract us from the fact that we are infinitesimally small bags of meat in an uncaring universe, following the winds of chemicals and electrical currents in the brains that will rot away someday! Well, he contemplated for a moment, it was just how close you were. Most humans instinctively shy away from us, are repelled by our alienness. Oh. Um, she contradicted the vampire law angle the same chapter that she introduced it. There's a chance that I might have read too much into this. It's not that deep, bro. And now, a word about our sponsor. When I want to enjoy a good audiobook but don't want to force potential overheard spoilers on the people around me, I throw in the everyday E25 earbuds that Raycon were kind enough to send me and enjoy the excellent listening experience they provide. They combine high quality sound, seamless Bluetooth pairing, extra bass, a comfortable design, and remarkably good noise isolation due to their adjustable fit. The earbuds themselves hold six hours of battery life and they can be recharged on the go with the incredibly compact charging case, bringing their usability up to a full 
24 hours. American celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Melissa Etheridge, and J.R. Smith are apparently all fans of Raycon, and with good reason. They were essential for getting through this book in particular, as when I got to a particularly stressful part, I grabbed my earbuds, switched to audiobook, and combined it with physical activity. Whimpering through crunches help take the mind off sparkly vampires. The everyday E25 earbuds provide the same advantages of high-end expensive makes for a much, much more reasonable price, and if you follow the link in the video description, buyraycon.com slash Dominic Noble, you get an additional 15% off your purchase. Part 4. Is there anything good about Twilight? Good is a strong word to use in this context, but it would be intellectually dishonest of me to present this review without acknowledging that I am not its target demographic, and to pretend like I can't comprehend any appeal for other people. Now, despite the fact that I'm a 33-year-old man who is about to tell young women why they liked something, I hope this doesn't come off as a complete mansplain. I was clued into most of this stuff by my co-writer Kate, who has a lot more first-hand knowledge with the female experience. Uh, I'm also very open to being corrected on any or all of this information, and I promise you I'm relaying it without judgement. Twilight is effectively pure, indulgent fantasy for people who, for whatever reason, maybe don't have the best self-esteem. I mean, before we even get to the sparkly boy toy, it was about a 17-year-old girl who was granted enough respect from her parents to be allowed to make the decision to move her entire life across the country, then instantly became the centre of attention at her new school, the object of every eligible boy's interest, and was gift-wrapped a close friend group to seamlessly slide into. What's more, she didn't have to actively work to get any of this lavish coursing, and gets to express disinterest and discomfort over it, so she and the reader can enjoy all the ego-boosting benefits of it without having to feel the inherent shame we, as a society, try to force on young women for daring to cause enough of a stir to get attention. Then of course there is Edward and his vampire thirst-based obsession with Bella. I touched upon this in my review of Twilight's Bastard Son, Fifty Shades, but to someone who has quite a humble view of themselves, the most alluring romantic fantasy can often be someone they would consider out of their league falling madly in love with them for some reason that is utterly out of their control. This bypasses the need to convince oneself that there is something worth loving about you, and takes a lot of the self-esteem based stress out of the relationship. Bella never has to worry about Edward finding someone better looking or more compatible than her, and she never has to make any effort to keep him impressed or interested. He will love her no matter what because her blood just smells so good. She can sit back and admire his alabaster brow in perfect security and relaxation. Twilight is the most effective use of this fantasy that I've ever read, and it's perfectly epitomised in Edward's line, I'm tired of trying to stay away from you. Again, no judgement from me, the egocentric power fantasies I enjoy aren't any more or less healthy. I was surprised to learn that despite later books being called out for pushing a suspiciously religious seeming anti premarital sex message, and showing a pretty poor attitude towards sexuality in general, one of the other appealing things about the first Twilight novel was its utter sexlessness. There is often a lot of pressure placed on young women to perform sexual acts with their partners or others that they're not entirely comfortable with or fully consent to, that can understandably lead to a lot of long-term anxiety. When you factor that in, Edward being the driving force in their abstinence could have a certain appeal. The before-mentioned feeling of safety that he gives her makes a lot more sense if you, like Bella, have complete faith in Edward to keep his self-control. I don't personally think there was sufficient evidence in the book to do this, but it's not unreasonable to accept something just because the POV character accepts it. I do this all the time in other books. And of course, on top of all that, monsters are sexy, vampires in particular. The mystique, the danger, the power. It kind of reminds me of my fetish for partners who wield swords. Objectively, there's nothing sexual about a person's potential to cut me in half with a blade, but I do not apologise for finding it enticing. Part 5. Are you quite finished? No! But I am going to reel off my other random thoughts on this book quick fire so we can wrap up and you can get back to your lives. Right! Right at the end of the book, there was a moment that actually legitimately amused me, because Edward seemed to become my personal stand-in for just a second, and was genuinely perplexed by Bella's behaviour. She gets pissed at him when she realises the reason they've gotten all dressed up is because he's taking her to prom, even though she hates dancing, and he asks her where she thought they were going, to which she admits that she was kind of hoping that he had changed his mind and was going to turn her into a vampire. Edward's response is basically... And you thought I was going to put on a tux for that? At one point, I think Maya was trying to build tension, but unfortunately she went about it by over-explaining every action that Bella performs as she has a shower, gets a snack, and boots up her computer, interlaced with mentioning every detail about the room she was in, and the end result was nothing but tedium. BTW, the thing that she was trying to make the reader anxious about, was Bella googling vampires. Oh no, sorry, not necessarily Google, it's actually described as her favourite search engine. 
Gosh, it has been a while since the early 2000s. Because Jacob wasn't really a part of this story, I think I should save discussing the cultural appropriation issues for the reviews of later novels, but I just wanted to let you know that I do see where this is going, and I am very uncomfortable. This might have been explained and I just missed it, but have Edward and the other vampire kids been in school this entire time? Like repeating these same classes over and over again for a century and only learning new things as they change the curriculum. If so, why? Surely there's something better he could be doing with his immortal life with a fake ID that claims he's just babyface and not really 17. As much as I've been poking fun of the sparkly thing all the way through this, I think this might have been one of the things that we did in fact overreact to. Dracula by Bram Stoker wasn't the creation of vampire mythology, but it is considered the base that almost all western vampire stories draw from, and Dracula also looked prettier in daylight and felt no particular need to burn up when he caught some rays. And the diamond skin thing may be a little lame, but authors try new things with vampire lore all the time, some of them are bound to be a dud. Quite late into her series, Anne Rice decided that vampires were created because 10,000 years ago the founder of Atlantis was abducted by aliens, modified into a lizard man, became a spirit and fused with the blood of a recently stabbed Egyptian queen, and we gave her less shit than we gave Maya for saying that their skin twinkles in daylight. I think that I've been pretty strong in this review for only bringing up Fifty Shades when strictly necessary, but I do want to mention that it was a trip to finally experience its progenitor and see how all the worst elements of Twilight became the main focus of James's book. I have to admit that I was secretly hoping that going into this with an open mind would result in a crowd shocking Twilight wasn't that bad actually episode or would at least lead to me discovering something that hasn't been mentioned a thousand times already, but as you can see, I clearly didn't bring anything new to the table here. Twilight's not very good, everybody. Stop the presses. It didn't deserve to be singled out for quite so much vitriol and mockery like it was, but there are some valid, serious issues to take with it. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Do return next time when I really hope I've got more to work with than a big old cup of meh. If you enjoyed this desperate attempt to milk a little more content out of this aging franchise, then be sure to do all that good YouTube channel supporting stuff, like hitting that like button, leaving a comment, sharing, and subscribing if you're new. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I will see you soon. Shiny, like a boy that can stop staring at your neck. What the heck, why is he so shiny? And how'd he save you from dying in that car wreck? It's so suspect, I don't know. He looks so young, 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 but he's paler than a junkie. A spider monkey, bright young heroine. You smell like heroin. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, Sam Cucinotta, and Atel Spurdloff, and special thanks to this video's co-producer, Kate Robinson. Be sure to check out her channel for more of that sweet, sweet YouTube content. Dopamine, serotonin, oxycotine, vasopressin. It's not a burst into song. Vasopressin, oxycotin. I have white hair all over my shirt for the final shot now. This was, this was my tactical error though. I don't blame you. You're a good kitty, Sateri. Oh, fuck.